while we're talking about being creative, I, in my experience, the, at least working with choral conductors, um, I've found that so many of them are really excellent arrangers um, and composers, but a lot of them find it easy to start with arranging if they're interested in trying out something creative. Um, and yes, it's going to be scary and new, but I would encourage you if you haven't, if you're listening to this and you're a band director and you have never tried arranging or composing, to just start with something simple for your students. Um, because I, so many, again, so many conductors are really good at this. Like you already know what works and you know your students better than any other composer, which is a really, like a really valuable thing. I, you'll know them better than, than I would if I was writing a piece for them. So yeah, give it, give it a try. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the great fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I really appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Inst Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now, onto my next guest, composer Dale Trimbor. Hi, Dale. Hi. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So, Dale, you are a little bit of an unusual guest in that you have not until now had much to do with the band community, but you have you have a lot to offer, I feel. And so can you introduce yourself for the listeners and tell them who you are? Absolutely. Uh, I'm a composer who writes a lot of choral music. Um, I work often with text in some form, um, but also I've been branching out um, my background, um, how I got started composing. There was a lot of music for for piano and then also chamber music too. Uh, and last year I wrote two orchestral works, which was a really great experience. So uh, I'm very interested in, in continuing to branch out beyond choral music, even though that's kind of what I've become known for. Mm -hmm. And we were just talking about this and I, I guess I will just not wait and I'll just say that you have a re you're, you're working on a piece right now, a commission for band? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm putting together a commissioning consortium, um, and we already have, I think we have four people signed up, um, and that's going to be, uh, the, I think that closes October 1st, and um, the piece will be delivered in January 2020. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be a six to eight minute grade four band piece, and I have no idea what I'm doing, except that I've written for orchestra and have really enjoyed hearing band music and getting to know uh, when band music too, and I'm looking forward to diving into it further. So you mentioned that you've written two pieces for orchestra in the last year, um, but that you've mostly worked with text. What is it? What is it like? What's the difference? Do you think? For for me, um, it's really nice when I have a text in mind, um, and when I'm setting that text to music. Um, that determines everything about the piece. It determines the the tone and the mood. Um, and the harmonic landscape of the piece, as well as more specific things like the, um, you know, the melodies, the rise and fall of the melody, the rhythms, of course. Um, maybe I, I approach that text trying to recreate the speech rhythms um, of the, the text that I'm setting. So when I'm writing something without a text, um, I have to come up with my own narrative journey for that piece. Um, there has to be another source of inspiration uh, something else that I can I can latch on to um, and think about as I'm writing the piece. So I have a journey in mind. I know where the piece is going and where it might end up. Mm -hmm. And what what challenges do you anticipate for the band piece? Uh, I think just that it's it, the first time writing for any new genre or medium. Um, I think it's challenging in that sort of things that we might talk about later, like <laughs> sure. um, imposter syndrome and self-doubt all pop up because um, 
it's, it's scary to do something unfamiliar and new. Um, I think it's, you know, when, when we stay safe and when we don't challenge ourselves, there's something very, um, it can be very comforting to do that in that we're not, um, we don't have to face any new fears, right? Um, being a, a little uncomfortable in a really, um, in a really interesting way, I think it challenges me. Um, it challenges my brain to come up with things I might not come up with if I was writing a choral piece. It pushes me. And I like that as a composer. Right. And so I buried the lead a little bit there. One of the things that is exciting about your career is right now you just released a book called Staying Composed. Overcoming. I did. A- oh, you want me to do the subtitle? <laughs> no, sure. I, ever, I can say it if you want. <laughs> and so this <laughs> is what I've interrupted you. This is what we're going to talk about later. And the subtitle is Overcoming Anxiety and Self Doubt Within a Creative Life. And I think this is something that's really urgent that we talk about. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go back and let's start at the beginning. So, Dale, how did you get into music? What was your early your early experiences with music? So I, like many, many composers I know, I, um, I was taking piano lessons. I started when I was about seven and, um, had a piano at home and really from a very early age was interested in just playing around at the piano and coming up with songs. And I was lucky to have, um, first a teacher who gave me a little composition notebook that I still, I think it's, my parents have it somewhere, but I, I found it a few years ago and was really excited to see pieces I was writing um, when I was about eight years old that were, they're, they're not anything to really, they're, you know, like five to eight measures long and kind of what you'd expect from a, a maybe an eight-year-old composing. But um, to have that early encouragement to write things down was really important. And then um, uh, I had a really wonderful piano teacher in high school and middle school as well who again, encouraged me to compose without any real input, but she just, she was sort of a a positive presence um, in that she saw what I was doing. And she said, you know, if you want to play an arrangement of something on a recital, you can. Uh, And then I had a high school choral teacher as well, who was um, very similarly encouraging, like passing along composition contests that I could apply to, um, some of which I ended up entering and winning, which was really wonderful and came about because of um, Barbara Klemp was my, uh, in Chatham, Chatham, New Jersey, uh, was my high school choral teacher. At what point did you know that you were going to be a professional musician or that you thought that maybe music as a profession was for you? For me, that, that came about uh, really sophomore year of high school when I was starting to think about colleges. And uh, I talked about this before, but I, there was a sort of a pivotal moment where I had to choose between taking music theory as an elective or journalism. And I picked music theory, um, and it's kind of, it's funny that I found my way back to writing, um, you know, later, later on in life. But um, once I took that first music theory class, it was just a total, a, a total sense of validation, like, oh, I am doing the right thing. I am, I am great at this, and I love it, which I couldn't say of many of my other high school classmates who I think were struggling a little bit um, or, the, or composing, they were like, oh no, we have to write a piece. And I was like, yes, we have to write a piece. <laughs> I get to compose in school, like on school time. What could be better than this? So that led to college and then to uh, getting my master's and um, to being a professional composer. Mm-hmm. So do you have, you know, thinking about your, your high school teacher, um, Mrs. Klemp, did I get it? Yeah. Yeah. Now she's Dr. Klemp. When you think about Dr. Klemp, what sort of lessons did she instill in you or teach her students that you remember the most? I think above all, there was a sense of professionalism in what we did. Um, I was a member of, there was a treble voice, uh, sort of varsity chorus with about 25 singers. And then one that was, uh, for mixed chorus. Um, so I was in the treble, the treble varsity chorus. And, um, we just, she, she treated us, you know, she held us to a really high standard of music making all the time. Um, and whenever we performed that came across too. And I think that's maybe above all, um, that plus the fact that she really just wanted me to keep going with everything I was doing and supported me however she could. Um, like they did (laughs) that, that same chorus did an arrangement of, and all that jazz from Chicago, (laughs) from the musical um chicago my i think it was 
my junior year of, um, of high school. But yeah, that encouragement plus that professionalism, that's, I've really, I think, carried that with me into my musical life. All right. So now how about, I know that one of the things I've heard interviews with you, just to tell the listeners, I know a little bit about your background because I've heard, but they, they may not know. I know that after you, when you were in school, you decided that you weren't going to pursue academia and that you were going to just try to write and make a career, a career out of it. Can you talk about that journey to becoming a full-time composer? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I knew for me, and this is very different for everyone. Um, I know I have a lot of friends who are really passionate about being in academia and, and teaching, teaching music theory and composition. Um, and I enjoy teaching one-on-one -on -one lessons still. And I do that sometimes, like if I'm doing a residency at a university, but this is all to say, um, I got my master's degree and by the second year of that, I felt like I was experiencing senioritis again. Like I just didn't, I didn't even want to go to classes really, which is kind of a, a sad thing in a way um, where I just, I just felt like so many of the classes, or maybe not, I shouldn't say that, but there were a couple classes where, where you have to take this class on, um, on like learning to research, uh, research things, but then maybe that's uh, like you're researching early music and it's, interesting, but not necessarily how I wanted to be spending my time at that moment. Um, I had just kind of reached a point where I, I knew I didn't want three to four more years of that. Um, and my end goal was very different from um, my colleagues I saw who were really fired up about getting a university position. Um, I actually, I have an aunt who worked for a long time as a professor of poetry. Um, at a state university in Louisiana. And I knew from talking to her that there's there's more that goes along with that kind of job than just um, just you know showing up and teaching. There's a lot of there's sort of businessy things and meetings that go along with it. So anyway, I knew I didn't want that life for myself. And um, I, I took a series of part-time jobs uh, while building my composing career and eventually the income, has just grown every year. And now I'm at the point where I have five uh, private piano and composition students. Um, and aside from that, I'm making all of my living from composing. Yeah, that's exceptional. It's a very difficult to do. And so congratulations. Thanks. And it's taken, I should say too, it's taken, uh, it's been, let's see, it's been a decade since I graduated from undergrad. So it's taken really a decade. I think people need to appreciate that it takes time. Yes, it yes, it absolutely does. And a lot of time and effort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and we'll talk about these things a little bit later. I mean, I know we're saving the the big the big discussion, but um I kind of want to dig into your choral music a little bit because again, a lot of music teachers listen. And so, can you maybe talk about one or two of the choral pieces that you'd want listeners who aren't familiar with your music to listen to? Do you, can you do that off the top of your head or is that putting you on the spot? Sure. Uh, one piece that was just performed at um, ACDA at the American Choral Directors Association Conference um, is called In the Middle, and it's for SATB chorus and piano. Um, and that I feel like is a really good representation of how I approach text and how the text really determines everything about a piece um, in that uh, the piece is about time and, and sort of the slipperiness of time how we lose track of it so easily. And then there are certain moments where we get caught up um, in just in a really lovely time in our lives. And it's like time stands still. And so the piano part uh, almost controls time. It's, I, I think in the program note, I call it sort of like an unreliable timekeeper where it's it's constantly ebbing and flowing uh, in, in the middle. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I'm going to listen to it for sure. What, um, where do you get your texts from? I'm lucky in that. I, so I mentioned the aunt who's a poet. Um, she put me in touch with, uh, via a call, just a call online for, um, for poems. Uh, she sort of facilitated my getting in touch with a bunch of living, living poets who I still work with, uh, now who I've collaborated with a, a whole bunch of times. Um, and then also I, um, 
I have a childhood friend who I work with, um, who I haven't seen in 15 years, but she's a brilliant writer. And I'm always asking her, like, send me your new work because um, I, I just love everything of hers that I read. Um, her name is Robin Myers. Uh, and then sometimes, um, more rarely, I will come across a poem um, somewhere like on the internet or Facebook, and I will reach out directly to the author. But um, a lot of it has been looking first to my network and then asking those people if they can recommend other other poets. You know, you mentioned network, and one of the one of the recurring themes on this show is the idea of building community around yourself and how mm-hmm. important that is to one's career, whether you're a band director or a composer or orchestral conductor, whatever it might be that you do. Yeah, it's, I, I found it's very, that's all very important, um, whether it's uh, just staying in touch with these same poets or looking for future performances of pieces and staying in touch with conductors um, or even getting to know other composers. Um, at least here in LA, I've found, I, I live in Los Angeles, um, I've found that there's a very supportive composer community here. And very frequently, we're actually recommending each other for other other commissions um, that maybe we can't take on, but we can refer a friend, um, a, a, like a talented friend who we know will do a really great job. It's been really lovely because I think sometimes you get the, the opposite impression, maybe hearing people talk about the arts um, or about music, thinking that uh, it's like very competitive and certainly can feel that way at times if you're applying for grants or contests, but uh, that hasn't been my experience. And I've been really lucky in that way. Dale, are your works all self-published? They are not all self-published. I, right now I have, I think 12 pieces traditionally published, um, choral pieces that are all available through Hal Leonard and are published with, um, some are through G. Shermer, some are through Boozine Hawks, um, and some are through their Mark Foster series. And then the rest are distributed. I'm actually switching distributors right now. Um, so I'm, I'm switching my works over to Graphite Marketplace, which is run by two composers, um, Tim Tukash and Jocelyn Hagen. So Dale, how about commissions? Do you work with uh, high school ensembles very often? I do. I do a lot of writing for um, a, a lot for collegiate groups and then um, a pretty good amount of uh, composing on commission as well for community ensembles and high schools. I see. And so what sort of value do you see from the the teacher and the student perspective? I know as a composer, we know, but how about from the other side? Well, I can tell you as a composer, I, or as a a very young composer, I didn't actually know, I didn't know of any living composers at all until I went to a chamber music camp that prioritized bringing in living composers to work with the students. Um, They had Miguel Del Aguila and um, Erica Wazen, um, come for performances. And that just, that was um, like, I knew that I wanted to keep composing, but seeing people actually doing it um, was was just kind of life-changing in a way. And I think even, um, even if that wasn't your goal, even if you don't, as a student, want to be a composer, uh, if you're at all uh, related to music. And of course, if you're in that ensemble, you are fundamentally a musician, right? Because just by the very definition of it doesn't matter if that's going to be your life goal, or you're going to work in accounting, you're still a musician. Um, so I think just knowing that there are, there are living composers out there and that you can interact with them, um, can be just very eye opening for a student. Uh, I know, I also like my favorite part of doing residencies with um, universities and high schools is the Q&A parts um, of those residencies where uh, I get really excellent questions about just what my what my day to day life looks like, what inspires me, um, who my influences have been. There's just all sorts of things where I think hearing those answers from someone working in the field can be just can be really inspiring for a student. Yeah, I really enjoy that part of it when I work with kids is the answering their questions, whether it's something as simple as like, what's your favorite color to like, you know, how did you start to write music or how do you write music? Those it's, it's, it's really special to see young people see a composer. Yes. And if I can inspire one person to try composing or arranging for the first time, that's even better. Yeah, which kind of gets me, gives me a little segue here because, you know, when I was a kid growing up, I would bang things out on the piano and like pretend I was making music. 
But all through high school, I was just played my trumpet and I just worked on trying to be the best trumpet player I could. And then when I went to college, I had a, a guy in our studio was writing brass quintets. And so I was just fascinated that he would just write these brass quintets. And it was that moment when I realized, well, wait a minute, you know, and it took me till college to get to that Mm -hmm. point. And so one of the things that I deal with, which is one of the reasons why you're here and because of your book is that I deal with a very serious case of imposter syndrome and anxiety in my own composing and about my own career. And so I, I think this might be a chance for us to kind of dig into that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know we were talking a little bit before too, um, before we started recording and I, I have always been anxious, um, uh, just my entire life. And so even writing this book where the, the subtitle says overcoming anxiety and self-doubt, um, even for me, it's an ongoing process. Uh, and I should be very upfront about that, that these are all of the strategies that help me move through anxiety. But, um, I actually had to have a friend remind me, um, she said that the the subtitle isn't not having anxiety, it's overcoming anxiety when it pops up. And I think it's very natural and and normal to have anxiety in a creative career. What are some of the best coping mechanisms that you've come up with to deal with your own anxiety? So for me, it's it's kind of twofold. Um, One aspect very much is figuring out a routine that works for me. Um, that keeps me very sane and productive. And for me, that means uh, prioritizing some form of exercise. Um, I was never an athletic kid (laughs) or person. Um, So for me, that might just be like a really long walk or even just doing 10 minutes of yoga at home. I really love the YouTube channel Yoga with Adrian. Um, It's all at home yoga. Um, And that just doing even 10 minutes, even a 10 minute walk that makes a big difference on my mental health. Um, and like, even when it seems like, Oh no, I should be sitting down and getting to my to-do list right away. No, no, I will have a much better, much more productive, much less anxious day. If I prioritize some form of exercise, um, before I, before I tackle that to-do list and, um, the other, really the the thesis of the book is about um, the whole, the entire point is recognizing what is challenging in your own creative process, Um, recognizing what you can't change, what will always feel difficult. And that might look like um, sitting down to start something for the, for the first time when you, um, what we talked about trying something new in a new genre. I think that's always going to be intimidating uh, for me and maybe for anyone. Um, or just starting any new piece, even even if it's something that I've written, you know, 50 pieces that are already that are SATB pieces um, for SATB chorus, still that first moment when I sit down to write might always be a bit um, frustrating in that I have to start something new. And then the other, so some things we can't change, but some things we can put practices in place to make them easier. Um, so I have, I know in the book, I talk about strategies for, um, for moving through self-doubt and for, uh, for overcoming, um, procrastination or all sorts of things. Um, jealousy is another one where yes, the frustration might always arise, but if you can give yourself sort of a mantra to repeat or, um, or just a, a new way of reframing that, so that you don't add anxiety to anxiety, (laughs) uh, that's going to make your life a lot easier. Well, these things can cascade on top of each other. I know that I'm not a jealous person, but when I'm feeling the most vulnerable is when that emotion can crop in. Yeah, I know social media, I think if we're talking about that specific feeling, I think social media has just made it infinitely worse. And, um, I'll be perfectly honest that I, uh, um, I've wanted to leave Facebook now, but I, uh, you know, it's for me, self, um, self promotion is very easy through Facebook Uh and I don't want to let go of it altogether quite yet. So I'm thinking about it. So what I've done is I started on following, um, well, I started on following fairly aggressively and now I actually, I unfollow everyone, um, except for my immediate family members and maybe like five, five friends. I think I follow a total of about 15 people on Facebook. 
Yeah, it's difficult because it's exactly right. You know, we are in a field where the social and I just talked about building community around yourself. And so that matters. But yet social media can bring out all of these anxieties if you're if you're predisposed to it. Yeah. And there are other ways like I I found the community on Twitter um, to be more supportive and less um, blatantly like here is my new thing. Click on it. Uh, though that that exists on Twitter, and I should mention too, you can you can mute people on any platform now. You can mute people on Instagram. You can mute people on Twitter, and I really haven't missed any of that. But I found other ways of staying in touch. Like I have um, a newsletter that I was sending out once a month. It's on a it's sort of a hiatus because I've gotten this has been a very busy, uh, <laughs> very busy year so far. But the newsletter will come back. And then just putting myself in situations where I can talk to people in real life, whether that's going to concerts or conferences, um, just seeking out those opportunities, uh, or even just finding one person locally to reach out to once a month or once a week, depending on how much time you have to get coffee and just catch up and ask them about their career. And that's infinitely preferable to me, especially as an introvert. Um, to just like a, a wave of bad, weird, maybe jealous feelings via Facebook. Um, just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone is so energizing to me, even as an introvert. Yeah. And this, this podcast is my therapy in a lot of ways because hmm. I get to talk to exceptionally talented people who make me feel like I can do what I'm doing. You know what I mean? That's wonderful. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I said last week in the in, in an interview with Lori Schwartz Reichel that I struggle with my definition of success. And this is what gives me anxiety is that I have that doctorate. I feel like I should be a college professor. Like that's what I train to do. But I'm teaching kids band, but I'm happy teaching kids band. Yet my inside, I've got a little voice telling me that I'm not successful. Mm. And that anxiety is really hard for me. And it, and it sort of filters into other things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think so for me, I, for a long time, and I talk about this in the book too, but I define success as making a living entirely from music um, or entirely from composing really not even just music because that happened a long time before what's happening now, which is composing can support me. And um, the closer I got to that, to actually achieving that, the, the, le the, the more I realized that that definition didn't feel um, adequate to me. Like that didn't feel like success because really success for, for me is getting to do what I love and what I find meaningful most of the time, right? If not every day, then for the vast majority of my time. And that's uh, that or some version of that has become my new version of success, my new definition, and just like reframing that has been really helpful. And I, I wonder if you and, and listeners <laughs> could come up with that. Like when you, you remove money and you remove uh, degrees from the equation, you remove all of your background and your training and what you think you should be doing. And you just take a hard look at what you actually find the most joy doing and base your definition of success on that. Right. Uh, if we were to look at it coldly as a business person or economically, we'd call that the sunk cost, right? We just have to, we mm -hmm. can't get caught up in that sunk cost. It's already done. Right. Right. And, and plenty of people too go all the way through. I know lots of people um, who I, I went to undergrad with and they got a performance degree and they hated it. Mm -hmm. um, and they just couldn't like, it, it just, made them incredibly anxious to have to practice that many hours um, and, and always be trying to please someone, whether it's the audience or their teacher, especially their teacher in an undergrad. And then now they work in arts administration where they've just gone completely to a different field and aren't even in music anymore and are happier. Yeah. Do you have an actionable tip or two for are the band directors who might be listening to the show about maybe what they can pull from this immediately? Yeah. Um, there's a lot, I, I do think, um, maybe I can give sort of a general answer and then, and then maybe dive into something more specific, but, uh, there's a whole chapter on procrastinating, which deals with 
creative blocks, but also just deals with anything that you don't want to do. And, and knowing the difference between, um, I, I actually, I've never seen this creative, maybe I'm, uh, I just haven't encountered it, but I've never seen this creative advice uh, anywhere before I wrote about it. This notion that um, for me, sometimes when I'm procrastinating doing something, it's actually a sign that I shouldn't do the thing. Uh, and most of the time we get procrastination advice on like overcoming procrastination and, and like how to just sit down and get things done and power through it and do what you've signed up to do. But, um, in the book, I talk about listening. There's a lot about just listening to your body and to how you feel and what your gut reaction is when you think about doing certain things and learning to tell the difference between, um, what is just fear and what is what is something that you, you just aren't interested in doing and how do you put things in place so that in the future you can say no to those kind that kind of commitment um, to things that do make you anxious and that aren't necessary for, for your career, no matter how necessary they may seem. So for band directors, maybe um, that would look like doing clinics or, or festivals or something where it maybe it looks good to do something and get the, the sort of the gold star, right? The recognition of having done something, but if it's, you know, the thing, <laughs> but, if, it, but if, if it's something that just makes your entire body feel tense or um, for me, anxiety tends to manifest as a, like a sort of clenching in my chest, um, which has led, has led me to go, to do the classic, like you go to the doctor and they're like, Oh no, you had a panic attack, not a heart attack. <laughs> um, but just learning to recognize those feelings and just, just keep drilling down. Like, do I really need to do this thing? Is this really important? Um, so, so often the answer, I mean, it might be, it might be different if it is, you know, written into your contract for your job that you have to do this thing. But for me, if I have that feeling, I've, I just, I do my best to stop doing that thing entirely. Maybe that'll, yeah. Yeah. My yeah. anxiety manifests itself the same way. I know that when my chest gets heavy or like I feel <laughs> that clenching, I know that's something that's getting, you know, making me anxious. And so I've learned to recognize that that's helped a lot is that sort of, I don't know what am I trying to say, that self-awareness to know when those symptoms are popping up. Yeah. I have a whole chapter in the book too, about, um, about that sort of that feeling. And for me, caffeine triggers that. And that's been an interesting lesson in um, learning to let anxiety pass without attaching to it. In that when I have, if I accidentally drip, drink a, a cup of um, like a regular Americano instead of a decaf one, um, later in the day, I catch my my chest, you know, there's kind of that heart racing feeling, but also my mind starts spiraling into like, what can I find that's wrong? Like, is mm. there something wrong in my relationship? Is my career falling apart? And it's, it's this crazy, like, it, it feels like anxiety. It feels like real anxiety, natural anxiety. Um, but once I can pinpoint that it came from caffeine, uh, I still feel all of those things. I still think those thoughts initially, but I can remind myself, no, no, that doesn't mean it's true. I just drank a cup of coffee mm -hmm. and the way that's translated, again, I said, I'm right. I'm a naturally anxious person, but even recognizing like, oh no, I'm, I'm in anxiety right now, but that doesn't mean the thoughts that my brain is telling me about, um, my, my worthiness or lack thereof, or my talent or lack thereof, doesn't mean those thoughts are true. Um, that's just how my bro my body processes, um, processes anxiety, right? That doesn't mean that I actually am unworthy or talentless. It just means that I'm moving through something and eventually I will find myself on the other side. And that will happen more quickly if I don't attach to those feelings and let them tell me lies. So you mentioned to me earlier that you like, you, you found inspiration in books on writing. And I know that I've heard you with other, um, on other podcasts talk about the Stephen King book on writing. Mm -hmm. it's another book that I really admire. And so how about the, the, the creative block? And I know it's common for both, you know, writers and artists and musicians. How do we manage that creative block? What, 
how do we kick that out of the way or kickstart our own selves, our own creativity? So in the book, I talk about a couple different approaches to this. Um, one thing that I do is when I'm, when I'm writing a new piece, I actively make a list or I don't have to do this anymore because it's, I've done it so many times, but if I was just starting out again, I would make a list of all the things that, um, that I can do when I don't have to be in the mood to compose. Oh, that's because, good advice. Uh, yeah. So, uh, that might be things like, um, putting in the lyrics into a choral piece or putting in dynamics or formatting, um, or any sort of outside of that piece, um, any sort of self-promotion. I don't have to be in any sort of creative mood, um, to, to send an email to someone <laughs> passing along a new piece, right? So I, I make this list of all of the things I can do when I'm not feeling um, very inspired. Um, although I'll, I'll come back to that word in a moment because we'll, we'll circle back to that. Sure. But anyway, then um, if I sit down to compose and I just, my brain is not having it, um, like, and I make myself try to. So I carve out a set time. For me, it's pretty much every weekday unless I'm traveling. But um, if you had a, a like a nine to five job or a school job, you could find weekday mornings maybe or evenings if you have kids, like maybe after the kids go to sleep or before they wake up. Um, but I keep that time sacred. And then I show up for that time, whether or not I'm in the mood. And I try composing. And then if I'm really not having it, then I go to my list of other things. And that's where, to circle back to that idea of inspiration, um, one thing that that Stephen King talks about in that, that book and a lot of other writers talk about, and I certainly agree with, is you don't, you don't have to be in the mood to be creative in order to be creative. So for me, it's all about the act of once I can get myself to sit down at my computer or my piano, wherever I'm, what, depending on what stage I'm in, um, usually I can get something done and maybe it's just a measure, but then I have one measure more than I had the day before. And that's still an accomplishment. Um, it's not zero. It's, <laughs> it's something. Um, so yeah. So I, when I say inspired to compose, I don't mean I'm just kind of waiting around for inspiration to strike. It's very much the opposite. I carve out that time and then I show up during that time. Um, but there are days, of course, there are, we all have days where we just don't, don't feel like getting things done. I did that last night. I told myself I was going to um, work on one of the new pieces that I have due uh, in the nearish future. <laughs> and um, I just wasn't, I just, for whatever reason, my, I couldn't make myself do it. And so instead I went and I edited another piece that's due pretty soon. And then I got into that and I actually, I actually ended up composing a little bit of that other piece. So now that piece is in much better shape than it was before in terms of formatting and um, music. All right, Dale. So I asked these questions of my band people. And so you're a musician, so you can answer them, certainly. And so the first is, where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition and music? I think that, I mean, I, I think competition can be good. And I, maybe I'm a little biased in that I got my start as a composer very much, um, applying to as many contests and calls for scores as I could. Um, and some of those contest wins have, um, have like have resulted in really wonderful relationships that I still have to this day. Um, but at the same time, I, as a musician, my mindset is never a competitive one, or I, maybe I should say is rarely a competitive one. Maybe I want to win a contest. But when I'm thinking about my peers and I'm looking at other composers, um, I honestly, like it serves me more to try and befriend them than it does to have any sort of competition with them. If I befriend them, they might recommend me for other opportunities or just be a resource for, um, for questions and th uh, hard things that come up in my career. If I have friends who do what I do, I can go to them with those fr frustrations and we can work through them together. Um, that's something else I talk about in the book where uh, if you have friends who do what you do, like if you're a band director and you have other band director friends or even like good acquaintances, you can go to them with questions that you really can't ask anyone else. You might not be able to ask your spouse or your other good friends. They, they, they won't get in there in the, in the weeds with you. 
So, Dale, one of the things that band directors like to joke about is that they're usually the last car in the parking lot every night. And I don't find this funny, <laughs> personally. Hmm. So how do you achieve a work-life balance? Well, I already talked about prioritizing things like exercise um, that I know um, I know will ultimately help my productivity and my sanity, even if it appears that they're taking time away from my work. So a lot of that is, is knowing when to step away. Um, and when I carve out those, that time for composing in my day, like for me, it's, it's often two to 4 PM. Um, sometimes it's one to four 30 or, you know, stretches into the evening, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it's, it's pretty much like those two, sometimes three or more hours are set aside. And once I hit, um, a good stopping place around 4 PM or so I'm, I'm done for the day. I walk away. Um, and I know that I can come back the next day and pick up that work pretty easily because there, because I could have kept going, but I've chosen to stop. All right. So what are the challenges facing music education? Now, maybe this can just be music in general, but what challenges do you see? And do you have any thoughts about how we can meet those challenges? I think there, well, right now, I think there's sort of a reckoning in, um, <laughs> in realizing that classical music as a whole has very much prioritized the music of composers who are white and male. Um, we're, we're sort of feeling, um, feeling aware of this, I think, across the board in choral music and band music, in, um, in new chamber music, in, in like every field. Uh, and I just, I, conversations about that, talking, talking with your peers about that, asking, um, if they have pieces that, or you can say something like, I'm looking to program more pieces by women, or I'm looking to program more music by composers who aren't white and male, um, or aren't exclusively white and male. That conversation, this is a whole, this could be a whole episode in and of itself, but it doesn't, it's not threatening. I don't see it as threatening the canon. I should say, like, I don't, I don't see it as like, oh, we're going to lose all of the great composers who happen to be white and or male um, in our, right? That's not the point of this discussion. It's to um, recognize elements of gatekeeping and uh, barriers to entry that have been in practice for a long time. Um, again, there's, I could go on a long rant about how financial privilege alone plays into who can be a successful composer and who can't, depending on where you can afford to go to school. It's and we don't see, I think educators don't necessarily even see that or know that, um, that it takes so much just to, um, just to live while you compose music um, or to put yourself in places like conferences, which can be very expensive to attend, especially when you're, um, when you're younger and don't, if you don't have, you know, like family support for what you do, um, it's just a very complicated thing. And I, a discussion, just keep keep talking about it. Yeah, no, it's, it's no question that, you know, it's expensive to go to conferences, it's expensive to go to composer retreats or, or band camps or conducting institutes or whatever it might be. All of these things cost money. And there are many people who don't have that privilege to be able to do those things. And so we have to be aware of that. Absolutely. And if you're a, a teacher that might affect your students, um, coming back to that idea of nurturing young composers, that might even affect who is willing to to raise their hand or come up to you after class and say, I want to write for this ensemble. It, you might want to take the responsibility for seeing really creative students and, and being the one to ask if they would like to try writing something for a reading session. Um, there's, it's just, yeah, the whole thing is more, more complex than it looks. And I, I think about this all the time because now I'm back teaching beginning band. And I, I do my very best to make sure that I'm programming a diverse set of composers. And yes, it may take a little extra effort because the people who have written, who don't look like me, who have written great beginning band music, I have to work harder to find that music. And that's okay. Right. And and a lot of that comes back to that, that idea of financial privilege. How do you even... and like going to the right university where your teacher suggests that you reach out to a publisher and then your music is readily available. Like if you don't have that experience, it's even harder for your music to get into the hands of people maybe who, who want to be programming it, but um, maybe you're not getting that advice on and that mentorship on how to get your music 
out there. So it's, yeah, more nuanced than it seems. <laughs> and we're not going to solve it right now. But um, yeah. What advice, if I can give you a time machine to go back to your high school graduation, what would you tell yourself? I So to be perfectly honest, there's not that much in my career that I would do differently. Um, I think there are maybe there are things that I would, I would encourage myself to do sooner, like to try writing an orchestra piece in undergrad, um, to, to try branching out and to keep writing. So I got, um, I've talked about this elsewhere too, but I got my undergrad degree. I actually have a dual degree in music and in English with a focus on creative writing and poetry. And then I stopped writing poetry, um, and just stopped writing in general for many years. So I would encourage myself to, yeah, to try branching out into as many things as possible as a young musician. Um, it's the best time to experiment. And then also to just keep, to keep writing, to not let a side passion disappear for five or seven years to just, um, even if it doesn't seem like it's relevant, um, if it's something you love, just find a way to keep doing it as often as possible. So Dale, I won't say band music because, um, for obvious reasons, but if you could plan it out, what would be the final work that you'd like to either conduct or hear or be involved with? I think so. I know, I know you, uh, you've said that this doesn't have to be your favorite piece. Um, but the, there's a choral piece, um, a short choral piece by Messian called O Sacrum Convivium, um, that I just think is like a near perfect little piece of music. And it just makes me so happy. Um, it's just the harmonies are are strange in exactly the right way. And it's like every chord is perfectly calibrated to be um, just exactly where it should be. Um, so I, I usually, maybe it's cheating a little bit in that I usually cite that as my favorite piece of music. Um, but I think it wouldn't be a bad way to go <laughs> if that was the last time. Because <laughs> it just, it just there's something so um, tight and satisfying about this little, I think it's five minutes or less um, choral piece. I find Messian's music to be that way in general. It's like, I don't know if I generally always like the experience at the time, but when it's done, I really like it. Like it, it, I can't explain it. Like you, there's an appreciation of it, of his music that I get when I, when I hear a piece live. I think some pieces too, it's almost like they, they're they like soul chiropractor like <laughs> adjustments <laughs> Did, where you, yeah, in the moment, you're maybe not quite sure how you're processing it. And then by the time you get to the end, something has changed. And that's something I think about a lot for my own music is how am I leaving the listeners in better emotional shape uh, in some way uh, by the time they arrive at an en the end of a piece or having performed it too. Like how are the performers different having spent hours and hours and hours learning this music? All right, Dale. So I always ask, is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote? Obviously you've just released your book. Let's give the title of that one more time for everybody. Sure. It's staying composed. And the subtitle is overcoming anxiety and self-doubt within a creative life. And again, it's not, not having anxiety. It's overcoming <laughs> anxiety when it occurs. <laughs> so Dale, how about the band commission, the consortium? How can people get involved in that? Yeah. So the, um, the link on my, it's on my website right now, I'm aggressively promoting the book, but, um, I think later in the summer, the band consortium will pop up right on the, um, like in the header of my website. But for now, the link is, um, my name. So Dale com slash band dash consortium. I will link it in the show notes for sure. So people can find that. That would be great. Thank you. Is there anything else? Uh, there's just, I mean, there's always, there's always a bunch of pieces <laughs> and there's always a bunch of dream projects and recordings. And, but I think we can leave it at that for now. Excellent. Dale, you should come to the Midwest clinic some year. I should. I think when I have a band piece, I will, <laughs> I will make an appearance. I've heard great things from everyone who's been. Yeah. All right, Dale, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, so right now I am still on Facebook, uh, though that might be changing. We'll see. But the easiest way to get uh, to get in touch with me is um, just through my website. Again, it's daletrombor.com. The contact form goes to my normal email. So I, I try to be fairly timely in responding. Um, so yeah, if you're listening to this and you have any um, 
any questions, or even if you just want to suggest a band piece that you love for me to listen to as I think about writing my first one, by all means, do reach out. Well, that that's good. Let me, let's just really quickly take a second. Do you have anything you're listening to now that, as far as preparing for this piece? So right now I'm, I'm deep in finishing three other pieces. So two choral pieces and a violin and piano piece. Um, so I've, I'm going to dive into band things probably in, uh, in early September is when I'll start writing uh-huh. this piece. And before I start writing it, I will, I will do a deep dive, but I also, I went to USC for my master's and Frank to Kelly teaches there. And so, um, I, I've enjoyed like everything of his in particular that I've heard. I just really, I really like. Well, I'm sure I've got listeners who are crawling through their headsets right now, trying to, you know, suggestions. Cause ask one of the things you can always count on is to ask a band director pieces. And they'll always come through for you. Oh, I'd love to see, especially if it's grade four, because that's what I'm that's what I'm aiming for. Um, yeah, please do uh, daletrumber.com slash contact, I think is just send them send them my way and I will happily listen. All right, Dale. I hope uh I hope I didn't unleash a can of worms on you there or a, you know, a deluge of emails. No, it'll be great. All right, Dale, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much again for having me. 